Good morning. Wow, that's, uh, you know, everybody got their appropriate amount of caffeine? All right. Um, we're, we're, we've got a tight time limit, and, and we, want, we want to kind of frame what we're talking about here, and certainly we'll stay afterwards if there's questions, and I know there's, you know, lots of other sessions that may touch on some of these things here. I want to give, you know, props to my co-presenter here, David. He, we reviewed our presentation yesterday while he was on a layover in Las Vegas. So he was in the airport, then he got, a, got here last night and did the four, 7 o'clock session. four airports yesterday. Yeah. Four airports. <laughs> so then he got here last night, did the 7 o'clock session and made it here on time. So, uh, you know, that's, that's dedication right there. <laughs> All right. So as we were talking about and planning this thing, the you know, idea came to us, so you're lobbying now, so now what? What do we do next? And this is not going to be a detailed discussion of what lobbying is and what lobbying isn't. But we, again, we'll certainly touch on some of those nuances. What we really wanted to say is there's organizations that may not have lobbied in the past and said, geez, I need to, or I'm going to, or I'm thinking about lobbying. So, okay, I've decided I'm going to do it. Now, what are the things I need to be aware of to make sure I'm com in compliance? And, uh, and, you know, just a quick side note on, on setting this up a little bit. There's organizations, that, and I work here in the, the D.C. office. I work for Gelman, Rosenberg, and Friedman. I guess we should have done the introductions here. And David will tell you a little bit about his background. Um, and I head up our nonprofit tax practice. And, you know, when you go out to clients now, depending on whether their funding is government funding, state funding, or elsewhere, some of the organizations that we deal with, and I'm going to talk primarily about C3s, and he's going to talk primarily about trade associations and others and some of those rules. But... There's organizations now that are considering lobbying that haven't done it in the past. And so once they make that leap and say, okay, we haven't done it in the past, or we've been doing it, we're just not sure what we've been doing, you know, our goal is to, is to arm you with some tools, whether you're the organizations or the advisors, to be able to um, uh, help them out here. And I should get the, get the clicker. All right, that's me. It's in your materials. You don't need to see that. And it, David, why don't you... Introduce yourself here, and then we'll. I'm <clears throat> serving as the uh, the leader of Clifton Larson Allen's national nonprofit tax practice. So I I run into this situation very frequently. All right. So how much lobbying can I do? Right. And just you know, we're talking about 501c3 organizations to start out with. Private foundations are prohibited from lobbying. So when we talk about that, just know that they can't. They're not supposed to lobby. And the technical aspect of this is that the, a 501c3 can't meet the organizational test, because you've got to be organized and operated for good C3 purposes, can't meet the organizational test if more than an insubstantial part of the activities are lobbying. Um, and, you know, we, saw, we heard a lot about some activity with C4s and how much they can do, and we'll get into that. But really, insubstantial is the, is the threshold. And they can't, and I, I never really kind of understood the, 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 I don't like the way they express the action organization, but you can't meet the operational test if your, your charitable purpose would be accomplished uh, through a substantial part would be to influence legislation. So those are the original parameters that came out to say, okay, what's, you know, how much lobbying can I do? Well, no substantial part. Okay, what does that mean? Anybody? 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 No? No? 15. There, there's, a, there's another court case that's, there's, there's, and there's not a lot of court cases on this, and I haven't seen in my experience a lot of C3s that got, uh, that got revoked for doing too much lobbying, and there's one that says 5% is okay. But beyond that, we don't really know what the, uh, what, what the limits are. The other thing is the exceptions can also be vague, right? So we, Originally in the code, we got 501c3. It says, can't do too much lobbying. We're not going to tell you how much that is. We'll just tell you when you do too much, right? And then what happens when you do too much is we revoke your exemption. Um, there's good news later for those of you that may not be familiar with it. But, um, and, and then the exceptions, the nonpartisan analysis, and we won't get into these in detail, examination of broad social issues, requested technical advice, self-defense, those exceptions really are not... Uh, they, they, they're really borrowed from the PF rules because the private foundation rules have some detailed things that say, you know, these are exceptions to lobbying. And most practitioners, I think, think that they translate over to the non-PF area, but again, that's not even uh, too specific. So 
how do we define substantial? You know, I look at this a little bit in the um, you kind of in the, the unrelated business income area to translate how much UBIT is too much UBIT. And it's the same thing. We, we won't tell you, but we'll tell you when it's too much, right? So we have some organizations that have millions of dollars of unrelated business income from a publication. But the amount of time and energy they spend doing advertising is small. So we say, we, you know, we say well, it's not just revenue. It's all, you, you got to look at the whole picture. And, and I think that that's the case here, but again, it's not really defined. Is it just revenue? Um, is, it, uh, is it hours? Volunteer efforts. What if you do your lobbying through volunteers? Well, that's still considered lobbying by your organization, and how much is too much? Um, is it the amount of energy and attention that your organization pays to lobbying? Or is it um, how much you spend? And we'll get to that. We'll get to an expenditure test in a little bit. So really, the... Um, you know, when the old rules where we just had, you know, you can't do more than an insubstantial amount and we're not going to tell you what it is, really created a lot of problems. Um, on the subjective test, you know, we'll talk about a more objective test. And a subjective test, large organizations may benefit from higher limits and we'll get into some details there. The problem with the vague standard, the no substantial part versus what we'll get into the 501H election is that even exceeding the limit for one year, technically, you could lose your exempt status, right? So not only do you, know, you not know what the standard is, the penalty is pretty high. Um, and so uh, and then there's a question of whether or not there would be a higher risk if you don't, uh, if you're under this no more than insubstantial, whether or not you would be a higher risk of audit exam. And David, I don't know if you have thoughts on that in your experience. I haven't, I haven't seen any, the IRS, when, when 4911, which we'll get into in a second, that is the expenditure test, when it first came out, people were saying, well, geez, if I elect that, will that, you know, will that help me or hurt me with, with my profile and audit? And quite honestly, I think the IRS has said, and I think, at least in my experience, the practice has been that it's, it, it really doesn't affect um, your profile and getting, getting audited. Now, the objective test, because of all the problems that, we, that you know, organizations struggled with, and I think it probably inhibited a lot of organizations in the past from doing lobbying, um, 4911 came into the code. And it's, under, it's the five, what, we'll, what we call the 501H election. So what happens with the 501H election is you and the IRS agree that my lobbying activities are going to be measured by this standard by this objective standard, and there are penalties, and we'll get into when you go over that standard for a year or what happens if you exceed it by too much, but those are the things that you agree to by making an election that you will be um, held to this standard. They also say that if you don't elect, you can't use this as a defense, right? You can't sit there and go, well, if I had elected, it wouldn't have been too much. The IRS says, sorry, you didn't elect. We agreed, we gave something up, you gave something up when you elect. You can't use that as a shield if you get audited and don't make the election because the election comes with benefits and burdens and we'll, we'll talk about that uh, in, in some detail. So you can, the great thing about the election is you can make it and revoke it, right? You can, you can make it and then say, well, you know what, my organization has changed, my circumstances have changed, I'm gonna, it, it no longer is beneficial to me, I'm going to revoke the election. Now, when you make the election, you can make the election during your tax year, and it will apply retroactively from the beginning of the year. When you revoke it, you have to revoke it prospectively. You can't go, you know, okay, we're, we're doing our 990, we're doing the limits here, and we go, oops, we've got an excise tax, let's, you know, let's go back and let's uh, try and revoke it. Um, it only, the revocation only applies prospectively. And just so you know, not all 501c3 organizations are able to make that election. Um, and there's a, a few organizations up there. I mentioned private foundations to begin with and supporting organizations of business leagues uh, and other organizations, social uh, unions and, and civic associations. So they are not eligible to make the, the 501H election. Questions, thoughts so far? Caffeine just kicking in. Oh, we have, we have a question. Ding, ding, ding. 
We, and we have a microphone. So I'm, I'm the CFO of a community foundation. We have supporting organizations. And we have three supporting organizations that have made the election as well as the community foundation. Does the cap that's assigned to the, the million, 250, all that, the cap, is that get spread across the, the four of us together because we're considered one organization? Or the individual. Right out of the box, we get a really, we get a, you know, really technical question. You know, nobody could just lob a softball up there for us, right? <laughs> right. We go right out of the box. There are rules for affiliated organizations, and 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 you'll see on the on the Schedule C for affiliated organizations, you can't, because you know, we got a bunch of smart people in the room. If if you'd say, well, geez, I could lobby up to a million dollars. I'll just create another organization and they could lobby and then they could lobby and they, if they meet the definition of being affiliated and, and probably they, you know, they would be because there's control, um, you have to uh, aggregate the limit. So you can't just you know, s spread it out among there. And it's similar in the corporate rules for the people that are um, uh, familiar with the corporate rules about the tax rates and splitting some of the benefits over a consolidated organization. But if you don't elect, there's rules about who, how you pay the tax and, and those kind of things. And you, you know, if you're a non-electing, I don't think you, you get, you have, you're supposed to report the lobbying on Schedule C, but you, you're not subject to the excise tax or anything like that. So, whew, glad I was ready for that one. Uh, <laughs> uh, we have a question back. administration of it is going pay, is being paid through one company is that one company on the hook for the for that amount or so, can they spread it among the three other unrelated organizations okay so in, in we'll, we'll talk about in some instances about grants to other organizations for lobbying and how you determine how much is lobbying but I think your question is a little bit a, a little bit twist on that and it's that we have three organizations that are technically unrelated but may have a common mission or a common goal so we're going to do lobbying through one of those organizations, and they're all going to um, they're all going to bear the cost. Um, I mean, I would I would take the position that if if I'm if I'm paying you to lobby, you know, whether you're a related organization, and, and sometimes it, you're going to have to get into the agreements and what they say because I would encourage you to have an agreement on this, whether it's a grant or a service agreement, saying we're giving you a hundred thousand dollars to lobby on our behalf and you're performing that service, I would count that, and if I was one of the organizations, as $100,000 toward my cap. Sometimes we have C3s and C4s, and the C3 will, they know what their lobbying limit is, and they will give a grant and say, this is for lobbying, this is 500000 and we report that because it's earmarked for lobbying. And I would say whether it's a grant or a service agreement, I would count that in that case, and each get their share rather than saying, um, you know, you get into the situation, are you double counting by 100,000 here, 100,000 here, 100,000 here, and then the fourth organization, oh, I've got you know, 300,000 of lobbying expenses. Um, so I would, I would allocate that to the extent that the agreements can support that. All right, um, quickly about the pros and cons of making the election. Um, the great thing is, Volunteer activities do not count. So if you're doing a lot of lobbying through volunteers, you don't have to count it. It's strictly an expenditure test. But it's a sliding scale based on your expenditures. And once you hit 17 million, you're capped at a million dollars of expenditures. And it starts out at 20%, and we'll see this in another slide, but at 20%. So it's pretty generous, the, uh, the level of lobbying they'll let you have. And then the, the percentage decreases as you go up. So most charities that have uh, exempt purpose expenditures of 17 million or less you know, would, would uh, benefit from higher limits by making the election. And you know, again, is it lower risk of IRS examination? Maybe in the sense that they know whether you're close to the line or not, but they can still come in and audit and say, what actually were your lobbying expenditures? And we'll talk about how you track those and what things need to be included in that uh, as we get toward the end. Um, larger organizations, you may have a hundred million dollar organization and do two million of lobbying. That's two percent. So a lot of larger organizations will not elect 
because um, they say I can do I can do a lot more lobbying and not be capped by that one million dollar limit. Um, and then if you exceed the lobbying limit of 150 percent, and we'll get into an example, um, you lose your exempt status if it's on a four year basis. So that is one of the the one of the and it, it's automatic. It's on your 990. Yes, I exceeded it. So the IRS can tell you did too much lobbying and revoke revoke you. So I mentioned this, and I'll just go through this briefly. There's the scale, 20% of your first 500,000 and 15 and 10, and then uh, you're capped at a million dollars. The other important thing uh, as you get into whether or not to make the election, you have to determine how much grassroots lobbying. And just briefly, you know, there's direct lobbying, you're contacting the legislature, and uh, legislators or certain people connected with them, or grassroots lobbying, you're telling people, go out, call your congressperson. Tell them to vote no. Tell them to vote yes. Grassroots lobbying is limited. You've got a million dollar limit, but you can only do 25% of that as grassroots. And if you exceed either the grassroots or the total during that four year period, so each year you exceed, you pay a tax of 25%. Um, so whether you exceed the total or the grassroots, you would be subject to that. So you have to be careful about that. So objective versus subjective test. We've got Life Forever Foundation, lobbying budget of $2 million. Organization spends $100 million on its programs and missions. Should I make the election? This is the audience participation part of this. Hi. Well, <laughs> there we we'll, go. We'll start by saying, if I've got $100 million worth of expenditures and I'm spending $2 million on lobbying, what's that percentage? Does anybody think 2% is excessive? I see head shaking, no. But when you hear that this organization spent two million dollars on lobbying, does that strike some people as a lot of money? I see a few heads nodding yes. So you see that there's a, a, a perception difference here. In percentage terms, it doesn't seem like much, but in real dollar terms, to some people, it would seem like a large amount. But based on, on the discussion so far, should they make this 501H election? If they make the 501H election, what is the absolute ceiling that they could spend on lobbying without any excise tax consequences? One million dollars, right? And they're well in excess of that. Now this was a real world example. This was an organization I worked with in the District of Columbia that had the 501H election in place. And when this fact pattern was pointed out to them, they decided to prospectively revoke that 501H election because they wanted to spend more than a million dollars on their lobbying activities and based on their exempt purpose expenditures we weren't concerned about them spending more than a million dollars on their lobbying activity so they revoked their election. Another example objective versus subjective test we've got a controller wants to spend uh, two million dollars lobbying next year and the year after and so our exempt purpose expenditures those are generally um, most of your expenditures, except for certain things like, uh, you know, if you have an in-house lobbying group of, I think, two or more people that, uh, or fundraising group, rather, two or more people that focus that, you would take those out. Um, unrelated business income taxes, you know, you take those out of the exempt purpose expenditures. Uh, but you've got your exempt purpose expenditures of 14 million, 16 million, 18 million, and, and 20 million dollars. And you see that the, uh, there's the amount that is your lobbying limit. And remember, of that amount, only 25% of that amount can be, uh, uh, can be grassroots lobbying. And there's your actual expenditures. So you'll see in, in uh, the first year, we're fine, right? We're under the 850000 So we wouldn't, no problem there. We don't have to pay a tax. Uh, we're all set. In the second year, we're about $12,000 over that lobbying limit. So we're subject to an excise tax of 25% or you know, just over $3,000. The following years, we, we have an issue because not only is it going to cost us money, but it's also going to go toward that four-year calculation of whether or not we've exceeded our, uh, our lobbying limit. So we've got a, a million dollars of excess in years uh, 15 and 16, and we've got an excise tax of 250000 each year. And even if you're willing to pay the excise tax, you obviously have to understand, what does that do with our four-year limit? Our four-year limit as you'll see, that column there is $3.8 million, 150% of this. And you can see there's, there's, a lot, you know, it's, there's a lot of room to manage this stuff if you're paying attention to it and if you know what goes into the calculation. $5.7 million, 
oops, we spent 65000 just over $65,000 too much. We've just blown our exemption for doing too much lobbying. This illustrates the two risks. One is the excise tax. Well, maybe the CEO has a stomach for that. He says, I'm willing to pay the excise tax because this election is, uh, is very important. This, this issue is very important. But the revocation issue is shown down on the bottom as something that's going to have to be addressed. So this controller would have to go back and say, look, we've got to stay below this over the four years. Otherwise, we risk revocation of our exempt status, which is effectively a death sentence to a 501c3 organization. In filling out the 990, Schedule C is the wrong time to find this out. <laughs> I think we can all agree on that. All right. <clears throat> the subtle color change indicates that the other speaker is going to talk for a little <laughs> while. Up till now, we've been discussing 501c3 organizations. And the unspoken question is, should a 501c3 organization lobby? Are they allowed to lobby? And a lot of people kind of think it's, it's icky. For a 501c3, oh, we would never do that. We would never soil our hands lobbying. We, we, we're not that kind of 501c3. But it, it, it's, it's fairly obvious to, to other people that lobbying can be an important part of any charitable mission. Creating a legislative environment, a legal environment that's favorable to your issue and your mission can be an important part of, of getting the job done. But what we recognize is because there's charitable donations coming in and because there's, there's charitable programs being run, we've concluded that there need to be limits to the amount of lobbying that a 501c3 can do. So you've, you've, we, we've just discussed how un, under an objective test we say, well, that limit is a million dollars, and under a subjective test that's probably a, a percentage of the total. But at any rate, we're, we're going to keep tight control over how much lobbying a 501c3 organization can do. However... 501c4, very similar in many ways to a 501c3, has the advantage of being able to do unlimited lobbying. Now, there's a price for that. What's the big disadvantage of being a 501c4 organization? The donations are not tax deductible as charitable contributions. So your donors are not able to take a charitable deduction to a 501c4 the way they could do a 501c3. But one of the trade-offs is, okay, then the 501c4 is going to be permitted to engage in unlimited lobbying. So you see the two revenue rulings up there. The second one actually extended that to, uh, to 501c5 and 501c6 organizations. So if you are a 501c6 trade association, could you spend 100% of your time, energy, and resources on lobbying and advocacy for your, for your membership? Yes, technically you could, okay? This is a very important distinction to understand, and that's why we've changed the slide color from orange to blue, so that mentally we can kind of say, okay, we're talking about a different animal here, one with, with a different set of, of limitations on it. Let's be honest. Some of the 501c4 organizations in particular could only accomplish their mission through the legislative process. Unless the laws get changed, there's really no way for them to accomplish their mission at all. That's what we call an action organization. So we mentioned earlier an action organization, an organization that cannot fulfill its mission outside the legislative process, they can't be a 501c3. All right? They would have to be a 501c4. All right, we're going to talk about an important distinction in what lobbying even means. Now, we said at the outset we weren't going to spend a whole lot of time defining it. There was a session uh, last year, and there will be other sessions you'll have the opportunity to attend that will really talk about what is lobbying and what is not lobbying. But one of the things about lobbying is that it has to involve the, a piece of legislation being discussed by a les legislature. Okay? For a 501c3, it's, it's kind of straightforward. But if you're a 501c4, 5, or 6, there are things that count as lobbying activities that don't count if you're a 501c3. And here they are. If you're lobbying, trying to influence the president or the vice president or the cabinet secretaries or some of these other uh, chief agency execs, if you're a 501c3, this doesn't count as lobbying. If you're a 501c4, 5, or 6, it does. So again, with your organization, if you're getting into this territory, it's important to get professional advice on, on what actually counts as lobbying activity because it's different for a C3 than it is for a C4 or a C6. Another important distinction is that 
501c6 organizations in particular will spend a lot of time communicating to their own members, right? Many of these are membership organizations. And if you are communicating to your members, it's almost like you're having a conversation with yourself, right? It's an internal conversation because your members are you for these purposes. So we had an extensive discussion last year about uh, what constitutes grassroots lobbying? What constitutes direct lobbying, right? Direct lobbying is when you, when you pick up the phone and call the senator and, and tell her to vote no on the piece of legislation. Grassroots is when you tell the public, you guys call your senator and tell her to vote no. But if you tell your members to do something, that is not lobbying. Now, when they do it, it might be. But when you're communicating with them, those internal communications are not considered lobbying. That's generally not an issue for a 501c3, although there are some 501c3s that, that consider themselves membership organizations. It's important to recognize that lobbying is not, it doesn't meet the definition of lobbying when you're having those internal conversations with your board members, your employees, your volunteers, your agents, your chapter members, and so forth. All right, now one of the things that, that provides an interesting wrinkle is that, in general, lobbying expenditures are not tax deductible, right? So if a C corporation does lobbying, they can't deduct that as an ordinary and necessary business expense. But if a C corporation is a member of a 501c6 trade association, that C corporation pays dues to the 501c6, they can deduct those dues as an ordinary and necessary business expense unless that trade association is spending those dues on lobbying, right? Because that would be a way to, to do an end run around the rules. Well, we're not allowed to deduct our lobbying expenses, but we can pay you guys to do it for us. No, it doesn't work like that. If you're paying the trade association membership dues and they're spending part of their resources on lobbying, then that portion of your dues is non-deductible. People say, well, we've just got this policy that says, our, membership, our members pay us dues, but we don't spend that money on lobbying. We spend this other money on lobbying. Well, you can't do that, right? Cash is fungible. So, again, if you're a membership organization, a 501c6 in particular, and you're collecting dues from your members, and you're spending any money on lobbying, then you have to let those folks know, hey, a portion of those dues, we spent that on lobbying. So you, you shouldn't be deducting that portion of the membership dues. And the way it works is you make a... Go back one slide, yep. please. What, what happens is you make an estimate at the beginning of the year, right? You send out the, the dues notice in January or February, okay? You don't know what you're going to spend on lobbying for the year, but you have an idea, right? So you put an estimate at the bottom. There'll be a little footnote that says 15% of these dues are, are non-deductible as lobbying expenditures. And that way they know that they can deduct 85%, but they can't deduct the 15%, because the 15% is your estimate of what you're going to spend on lobbying. Now, at the end of the year... Did it come out exactly at 15%? No, it never does. At the end of the year, is that my phone? <laughs> at the end of the year, you, you say, well, now let's, let's tally it up. What did we really spend on lobbying? And there's going to be a surplus or a deficit there, right? Now, if there is a deficit, generally organizations will carry that deficit forward. Okay, they can pay a proxy tax. We'll get into the proxy tax in a moment. But in most cases, they'll say, look, if we, if we underestimate a little bit, if we said 15%, but it came out to 18%, eh, so we underestimate a little bit, we can carry that deficit forward and make it up next year. Either spend less on lobbying next year or, or raise that 15% on the notice to, to 18%. There's, there's ways we can deal with that. What's less clear, and Dick and I have not discussed this, so I don't know if he agrees with me or not on this. <laughs> What's less clear is what to do if there's a surplus. Okay, and, and I'm just going to give you my opinion here, right? That's why we're here. We're here to, we're here to hear, hear each other's opinions on some of this stuff. My experience has been that the, the attorneys will tell you that a surplus could get carried forward just the same as a, as a deficit can, whereas an accountant, the CPA, is less likely to tell you. A lot of CPAs will just take that, that surplus and zero it out. They'll make you carry the deficit forward, but the surplus they'll zero out. The reason for that, in, in my view, is that the Internal Revenue Code specifically tells you what to do with a deficit. It is silent on what to do with a surplus. So my experience has generally been an accountant will say, if you can't do anything unless the code says you can, whereas an attorney will say, you can do anything unless the code says you can't. Okay, so it's a little bit different perspective there. All right, so what do you do with a surplus? 
Well, what I do is I advise my clients of the risk. I say, you know, if you run a surplus and then you try to use it in a later year, you know, we ran a surplus for three years, now in year four we've got a deficit, well, let's use some of that surplus. Well, guess which year the IRS is going to pick to examine you? It's, 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 it's the luck of the draw is going to be they're going to examine you in that year you had a deficit and tried to use that surplus. So the agent may come to you and say, what are you doing here? They, they, point to the code section that says you're allowed to do this. And you're going to look at them and say, point to the code section that says I can't. Right? But there is a risk there. There is, a, there, there, is, there is room for reasonable people to disagree on what to do with that surplus. And we, we typically do, we do the same thing. We advise our clients that there is some risk, but um, really, and I know you should never, ever try and apply logic to the tax code. But in this case, you'd sit there and go, come on. Because a lot of our clients, to be safe, overestimate the amount that they think they're going to be doing. And we, when we see them running large deficits, we say, you need to get this a little closer because what you're doing is you're hurting your members who are deducting these dues. So That's an excellent point. What, do you think it was really congressional intent for people to always underestimate? I don't think Congress intended for people to play games with this. Congress probably wanted them to estimate as close as possible. But if there's this perverse result where a deficit gets carried forward and a surplus does not, it gives people opportunity to play games with it and deliberately underestimate. And I don't yeah. think that was the intention. Yeah. I agree. And for some of our clients, you know, there's different years we're dealing with. You're sending out dues notices. You're finding out what your surplus or deficit is, you know, when you're filing your 990 typically, although they should probably track it m more during the year. So the timing can also present a big issue. In, in now, of course, your other option is to not tell the donors that a portion is non-deductible. Right? You can tell them the whole thing is deductible, then you can pay the proxy tax for them. In other words, the amount that, that they deducted that they probably shouldn't have, you can pay the tax for them, and that would be at a flat 35% rate. Um, you do not have to make estimated payments on that, but you probably do have to pay it by your original due date, not the extended due date. Debbie? Yeah, I just wanted to say Yeah, he'll, he'll, he'll turn it up here in a second. Hello. Yep, there we go. Oh, okay. Um, with regard to being able to, to carry over an underage, as I call it, back when um, this was all instituted, I was attending probably an AICPA conference where there were IRS people talking, and we were talking about that. And, and I don't remember who said it, and obviously the personnel have all changed over, but they basically said, unofficially, you can carry that underage forward. And that is the position I've always taken, and fortunately, none of my clients have ever been called on it. You know, again, you are in danger if you try to ascribe logic to the tax code, but, you know, I, it's a small risk, but I don't know that it's a huge risk. I think you just, everybody has to take it for themselves. I'm ready for that. All right, I, so there's... Wait, I have a couple questions from online. From the... From the <laughs> internet. Um, is it acceptable for an association to make the non-deductible percentage of its dues available on the member section of the website rather than directly on the due statement? Yes, but it should still be the estimate. What I find is some organizations like to, at the end of the year, kind of update that. You don't want to do that. The organization needs to have a, a pretty clear calculation of what the members would have treated as non-deductible. So always stick with your estimate. Awesome. And then there's a couple other more general questions. Um, one question is, we pay dues to organizations that lobby, and we also lobby on behalf of others who provide financial support. Are we required to allocate lobbying costs out to funders, and are we required to report the portion of our dues as lobbying costs? We've got a slide coming up, I think, that's okay, going to address great. that one. And, and then one more. Well, I, I th why, don't we, why don't we go ahead and hold great. that, because otherwise we're not going to get to the political okay. section. We're, we're, we're running out of time. Okay. All right. Um, just real quickly. You don't have to worry about lobbying if you're spending less than $2,000 on it. You don't have to worry about notifying your members of anything. And also, if you're aware that your members are not the kind of organizations can, that can deduct these dues anyway, then you don't have to fill out this portion of the Schedule C. Okay, there's also exceptions if the dues amount is below $75. I had a client come to me and their membership dues were $11. Okay, we didn't have to worry about them. Also, with the 501c5, it's important to recognize that it only applies to agricultural and horticultural 501c5s. Other 501c5s aren't subject to this kind of reporting either. So, again, there are exceptions and exceptions to the exceptions, and you need to, you need to have good advice uh, when you're not trying to navigate this. We're now going to switch back to an orange slide, I think. Short so, and sweet, Dick. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> 
I gave you the answer. How much political activity can a C3 do? None. Now, does it happen? Yes. Um, sometimes there will be inadvertent things. You know, the, the typical example I see is where you have a local organization that will buy a ticket to a fundraiser for a politician, and they'll go, but we, it's not political because we bought one for the Republican and the Democrat. It's like, well, then you violated twice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But th there, is, there is an excise tax, and you'll see on Schedule C, we won't spend a lot of time on it, but there's an excise tax, I think, under 4955. And the IRS understands that if there's inadvertent things that were corrected, um, you know, uh, you, they, they, they could, but they won't typically pull your exempt status for that, and you report it and pay an excise tax. I saw something very similar, an organization that, that gave $20,000 to the Republican Governors Association and the Democrat Governors Association, and they wanted to treat it as a Schedule I grant. So we weren't trying to get any of them elected. We just wanted to get in the club. We wanted to get invited to their parties so we could, uh, you know, talk to them and get to know them and talk about our issue. But the rule really is if you're giving money to a 527 organization, and, and both the Republican governors and the Democrat governors associations are 527, so you have made an expenditure to a 527, regardless of what your motive for it was. Um, yeah. did, they, did, they get, did they ask for the money? Back no, to we, correct or just pay the tax? We paid the tax. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So different, again, we're talking, the slide is blue, right? So 501c405 or 6. We said they could do unlimited lobbying because lobbying seemed to be very related to their mission, okay? If it's a 501c4 with a social welfare mission, lobbying is a big part of that. If they're a 501c6 trying to create a favorable environment for their trade, lobbying is a big part of that. Politics, a little different. Okay? And remember, lobbying is trying to get a piece of legislation passed or defeated. Politics is trying to get a candidate elected or defeated. All right? So they are not forbidden from doing this. A 501c3 is forbidden, but a 4, 5, and 6 are permitted to do it, but it cannot be their primary purpose. And remember, this was, this was a lot of the, the controversy, the so-called uh, Tea Party scandal at the IRS, kind of revolved around this issue, the, the awareness that they were trying to set up a 501c4 organization that politics was going to be the primary purpose. Now, the IRS got a, a significant amount of heat for the way they handled it, but the bottom line concern was based on this, is we, we think you are a 527 organization masquerading as a 501c4 because you're trying to evade some of the, the onerous reporting requirements on a 527. All right, so th this is subject to a significant amount of abuse, not to mention the fact that people can disagree on what primary purpose is, right? Some people would say, well, as long as it's uh, less than 50% of my activity, it's not my primary purpose. Whereas other people would say, yeah, but if you've got 10 activities and this is the biggest, then it is your primary purpose. So, so reasonable people have come to different conclusions on how to interpret this primary purpose. We generally, in the accounting profession, I think will will start getting nervous when it gets up around 49%, because then it's impossible to argue that it's not your primary purpose. Um, and then there's this ugly 1120 POL, okay? And everybody, I, every face in here has got a sneer on it right now, because that is, that is one of the more unpleasant forms that a, a nonprofit organization ever has to deal with. But basically what it says is, look, if you, as a C4, 5, or 6, really do make a political expenditure, that's okay. We're not going to yank your exemption. You just can't do it tax-free. Nobody else can do it tax-free. Why should you be able to do it tax-free? So the money you raise and sub subsequently spent on political intervention, you're going to pay a 35% C corporation tax rate, okay, as if that income, that revenue had been taxable in the first place. Or, we're going to cut you a bit of a break, if your investment income is lower than your political expenditure, in other words, we'll charge you 35% of the lower of these two numbers, okay? They're not going to not going to charge you on all your programmatic revenue, just your investment income, and we'll uh, we'll explore this a little bit more in subsequent slides. One way to get around this, in fact, a common sense way, and I sometimes my clients will call me the the next summer after they've done this the year before, and it's it's too late. But it's like you know, there's an easy way to deal with this. And it's this concept of a separately segregated fund. And we're not going to spend an, a, an inordinate amount of time discussing how to set these up. But the basic idea is you have a separate employer identification number, separate bank accounts. You uh, immediately take any funds designated for that account and you put them in there right away. And you make sure that if they're going to make political expenditures, they don't have any investment income, right? We said the tax was going to be the lower 
of the political expenditures of the investment income, right? So you keep, you keep the investment income in, in your hands and the political expenditures in their hands, and you can avoid a lot of the 35% uh, the exposure there. Yeah, the question that often comes up when we ask people with separate segregated funds, because they're not really these organizations, they're kind of this, they're a bank account, typically. Mm -hmm. And you say, well, when you come to the 990 and you're doing Schedule R, and you see, realize that you've got a C3, a C4, and a, and a PAC, or a C3, C6, and a PAC, is that a related organization? And typically we treat them as that because there's an officer who's a treasurer of the PAC, who's also an officer of the organization, but I, I don't... I, I haven't found anything clearly that says, oh, yeah, when you have a PAC, this is what it is. And the lawyers know. And so typically we talk to the lawyers, and they'll say, yes, they're related. But the clients generally don't know that it's a, it's a bank account. And so they, they're treating it as a bank account, but it's really a separate organization. It for, does have its own tax ID in yes. most cases, though. So, so my advice to a client is you never, <laughs> you never go wrong with transparency. I mean, I don't want to disclose stuff that, that I don't have to at all. But there's enough of a gray area here that I will say, look, I've had clients get accused of trying to hide stuff. Like, we know you guys have a pack. Why isn't it on your schedule? What are you trying to hide? Like, that, that's an uncomfortable question to kind of deal with. And, and since you're, you're being open that there is a separately segregated fund, you had to mention it on your Schedule C, yeah. it doesn't hurt to put it on Schedule R, too, and, and just avoid the, avoid the accusation. Yeah. And there's some nuances in the election rules that I don't know, but, again, the attorneys know, that talk about whether it's controlled or not controlled. But they've told me, basically, separate segregated funds are almost always going to be related for our purposes. Political Action Committee is a true PAC. Um, has some appeal to it, but the thing to remember about a PAC is, it, 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 in a way, it's almost like a mirror image of the other exempt organization. You think of a standard 501c organization, it's like, well, you can do all these kind of uh, exempt activities, but if you get involved in, in political intervention, then there's tax consequences. Whereas for a, fi for a PAC, it's almost the opposite. You can get involved in the political activities, but if you start doing anything else, you're going to pay tax on that. Okay? So again, political action committees are not for the faint of heart. These are definitely uh, organizations that need to be well-supervised, well-managed, uh, have, have definite uh, understanding of, of all that, that dark money. And, and uh, <laughs> You know, the, the, the only time I ever wrote an article and got hate mail for it was on this topic. I, I think your organization sucks. I'm taking all my business elsewhere because you approve of dark money, whereas really all I was saying was that you know, if, if, if organizations are going to get involved in these political activities, they need to understand what the limitations are. So definitely, uh, definitely a controversial area for a lot of people. Okay, one thing we talked about is maintaining adequate records. You know, okay, we're going to do lobbying. We know we've got this limit, this expenditure limit, or we didn't elect, and we need to report the activities, including volunteer activities that we did on our Schedule C. And how do we keep track of it? Well, um, you know, we need to document the activities. If you, it's a little easier if you're doing it through an outside, you hire a lobbying firm, and you should tell them, you need to give me a breakout of what was lobbying versus advocacy and other things they're charging you for. Um, and so, you know, retaining the, the communications. Timesheets, if, if you're doing it internally, timesheets or other allocations are probably the best way to track the activity. And then cost logs associated with your lobbying. Um, you also, if you're electing, you need to make sure you track your grassroots versus your direct. Um, and there, there's, and I won't get into a lot of detail on this, but there's mixed, uh, mixed purpose communications. You send out a fundraising that also has lobbying in it. There are rules that tell you how much you have to allocate, and it, and it depends on whether your communication primarily goes to members or non-members, and, and how you track those those activities. Um, and this is not a plug for anything that I just find this really useful. And they've got a number of things. Uh, it's uh, Alliance for Justice, keeping track. A Guide to Record Keeping. Uh, you can just Google this and find it. It's by John Pomerantz, who, who's a, an attorney here in town. And there's other publications they have about this. But it goes through and makes recommendations about and gives some examples about timesheets, different circumstances, about how you need to track the time. Because it's not just your labor costs, your time that goes into that, but it's also allocating overhead. You know, you got 10 employees, one does lobbying. Well, what about the rent and the utilities and all those other things that go into that? And I think Sometimes as practitioners, we say, how much did you spend on lobbying? And they go, this much. And we don't drill down enough to say, okay, let's talk about how you're capturing those things.
Um, and, and I think that that's an area that, that a lot of organizations may or should revisit every once in a while, making sure they're capturing all those activities. Um, the next slide is, you know, we talked about the cost that go into it, you know, uh, labor, you know, lobbying reports from your organization. If you're hiring a lobbyist, you know, tell them up front, we need this breakout because not everything you pay them will be considered lobbying. You know, the direct costs and then, as I mentioned, the allocation of overhead. We talked, and, and this came up in a couple of contexts here, um, grants to other organizations earmarked for lobbying. And the rules, you have to know these rules because if you don't put the right language in, it can really come back to bite you. And I've seen a, a, an example or two where we go, oh, you, you know, it would have been so easy to, to, to you know, because it, it'll all be treated, basically the rules are slanted to be treated toward the worst kind of lobbying if you're electing. So if it's earmarked for grassroots, the entire amount's grassroots. If it's allocated, and again, the first example is we're earmarking a grant for lobbying. We're saying, here's some money to do lobbying, and it's similar to a situation that was raised earlier. If allocated to both, the entire amount is grassroots, except to the extent you can show it was for direct lobbying. So if, if, if you allocate it to both, you have to prove how much was not the bad stuff or the, the one with the lower limit grassroots lobbying. Now, a general support grant to an organization, here's money that's not earmarked. And you can get into a whole thing about what things you need that are earmarked, you know, to, to prove it was earmarked or not earmarked, is not lobbying, even if some of the funds they use are for lobbying. So you give them a general support grant, it's not earmarked, you're okay. A project grant, okay, you're doing this project, and it's a discrete project that you're funding, and some of it is lobbying, as long as, and this, I think this borrows from the, from the private foundation rules as well, it's not lobbying to the extent um, it doesn't exceed the non-lobbying portion of the grant. Million dollar project, 200 is for lobbying, you give 700,000, it's not, you don't have to treat it as lobbying. Even though you know where, but what about the person that gives 300,000, right? Um, as long as it's not earmarked for lobbying, you can, you can uh, avoid having to treat it as lobbying if you follow these rules. And you need to be, you want to be specific in that. Um, and this, I've already mentioned this, so I'll go through this quickly. Detailed reporting of lobbying activities. If you don't elect under 501H, you know, you need uh, to report all your lobbying activities, including volunteers, in a detailed description. That's another area that I think non-electing charities may fall down a little bit. They just give a very brief description, it should be a little bit more detailed. On the objective test, it's just your expenditures, and obviously you need a reasonable method to allocate joint costs, things that are lobbying versus, uh, versus non-lobbying. How should we calculate exempt purpose expenditures? I'll go through, I mentioned this earlier, it's not applicable to non-electing uh, organizations. But if you are electing, it's basically your program, your management in general, and fundraising expenditures, but not your lobbying. Um, you have to exclude, and these are things that are right in the instructions, capitalized expenditures, um, expenses deducted on your 990T, and then professional fundraisers uh, if you have two or more, and in, in, in including internal fundraisers if two or more people spend, uh, spend a, lot of their, a majority of their time doing that. And then transfers to other organizations for lobbying. So we have one minute left. Um, 501C4, 5, and 6 organizations have some predefined ways of calculating their expenses. The, the IRS will allow reasonable and consistent methods, but they've put three or four of them out there that they've kind of put their stamp of approval on. So if you use one of these methods to, to track your expenditures, then they will bless it uh, ahead of time. And one of it is just to do a ratio. You, you kind of say, well, these are our direct expenses, but when we're calculating our indirect, we're going to do it as a ratio where the numerator is the amount we spend on lobbying and the denominator is everything and apply that ratio to our overhead. The second example is what they call the, the gross up method where you can determine your salary expenses for your um, executives and their clerical support and multiply it by 175 percent or there's a shortcut where you don't have to worry about the, uh, the clerical support but then you have to multiply it by 225 percent. So we have a lot of clients that use this method. The fourth method I've never actually seen in practice and, and can't claim to be a, an expert at it. And then on our last slide, there is a de minimis rule below which you can ignore certain people because they just don't spend enough to worry about. And like I said, these are pre-blessed uh, 
approaches that a 501c4 or 501c6 can use in tracking uh, its overhead expenses, its indirect expenses, but there may be other reasonable and consistent ways to do it. So thank you, everyone, for your attendance. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.